Did you know that every two years you should freshen up your website and every five years you should overhaul your website? Our guest today is going to teach the value and importance of maintaining your website and keeping it fresh. This episode on the Fitness Business Podcast is perfect for marketing directors, general managers, and boutique owners that wear a lot of hats in their business. Looking for an episode recommendation? Check out episode number 370. It's entitled, Unique and Thrifty Ideas Any Club Can Implement to Improve Member Experience. Our guest, Crystal Reynolds, she puts a little fun and then she mixes some creativity to bring her members the most memorable experience possible. And finally, if you get value from any of our shows or any of our guests, we would be super grateful if you would post a review on iTunes. Hey, welcome back, Fitness Business Podcast family. I am your host, Dori Nugent, and today our industry expert, Jessica Freeman, is here to give her best advice on how to make your website for you and your facility. Jessica is the owner of Jess Creatives, and she is an Atlanta-based award-winning web designer. Jess's episode will begin shortly, but first, a big thank you to One Fit Stop for sponsoring this episode. OneFitStop is modern fitness studio software built for the growing multi-location studio, providing scheduling, client management, programming, payment collection tools, and more that will set your business up to grow, grow, grow. To find out more, go to onefitstop.com or click on the link in today's show notes. Thanks again, OneFitStop. You can find additional information at www.onefitstop.com. Get your pen ready now for Keep Me's Fit Bizpiration. What are your three tips to make your website work for your business goals? Yeah, so the first thing I would say, start looking at your website analytics. You don't know what's working if you don't look at the numbers and the data. So that's the very first step you should take. Second, make sure you have plenty of testimonials around your site. That social proof is super, super important. Put up all the testimonials that you can. (laughs) Even if you start running out of space, set up a dedicated page that's just testimonials from your clients and customers. And lastly, start working on your SEO if you haven't already. SEO is search engine optimization that gets you in front of more people in Google search which helps get more people on your site, more people in your doors. So you really want to make sure that you are driving that traffic because if people don't know about your website, then they can't go to the website to find out about you. Next week, the dynamic duo of Sydney Andress and Megan Simpson from Sherpa Collaborative will be joining me on the podcast. Sydney and Megan bring their combined expertise when talking about lead generation tips for Google. It is going to be a great show. At Discover Strength Franchising, we know you want to own a thriving fitness business. We believe you should be able to do work that you are passionate about while also making a great living. Imagine owning a distinguished fitness business backed by a market-tested business model where efficient, 30-minute strength workouts are provided to your clients by expert, educated personal trainers. Here's how to get started. Head to discoverstrengthfranchise.com and fill out the contact form. Set up a pre-qualification call with our franchise team. Join us for a mutual discovery day. So head to discoverstrengthfranchise.com so you can start falling in love with your work again. Let's transition into this week's interview with Jessica Freeman. It is time for another Fitness Business Podcast episode, and today our guest is Jessica Freeman. Jessica is a graphic and web designer. She owns an online business called Jess Creatives, and she really deals with designing websites or helping owners design websites in the health and fitness industry. So Jessica, thank you so much for coming on. You are a perfect guest for us here on the Fitness Business Podcast. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. 
So how old is Jess Creatives? Uh, we turned 10 years old just this past year. Ooh, you're yeah. no longer a baby or toddler. We're, we're getting into... We're, we're getting up there in age. <laughs> Well, that is fantastic. I love our topic today, and that's called making your website work for you. And I know this is such a hot topic for all of us because one of the challenges for many gyms and studio owners, even trainers, is their website. And, and, you know, how do they make that? How do they build their website in a sense of, are they trying to use it to generate sales or are they trying to use it to generate retention? Love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I primarily treat websites as a way to get new clients, new customers. A lot of people treat their website like, oh, but I, you know, my clients understand this and they know, and I'm like, wait, but they're already working with you. Like they don't usually have a reason to go back to your website. Now that's not to say you can't use your website as part of retention. There are some things you could do with like content creation, writing blog posts, highlighting members in your gym or studio, educating them, especially during the pandemic, like putting workouts, you know, home workouts on the blog or something like that's a good thing. If you are a gym or studio that your members sign up and pay through the website, there is some functionality you could try with, you know, hey, before you cancel, like, do you want to try, you know, like, here's a special offer or like, come back, like things like that, that you could do. But a lot of the website is meant to attract new people. And we need to remember that because a lot of our traffic is people who have no idea what we're about. So don't use insider language. Treat it as like people who have no idea where you're located, what you're about, who's at your gym, who your gym is for. We want to treat them as complete strangers, like new to town, have never been to a gym before. I think that's such great advice because again, personal experience there are sometimes I go on a website just to be like, all right, you know, where's our locations at? Is there one? <laughs> is there multiple? And sometimes that is the hardest thing to find. And it's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very frustrating. So I like the fact that, you know, you, you're saying don't use the insider language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super, super important. Now, especially there are gyms I know that like, no, we are for elite athletes or things like that. So you might be able to talk a little more on the jargon side because it's people who are used to being at a gym. But if you are not in that realm and you have people who are first timers, like you need to be super clear about what is this type of gym? Who can come here? What, what does this type of exercise mean? Like what is strength and conditioning? Like what's conditioning? <laughs> you know, some people might not know what that means. And so you really need to have like a fresh pair of eyes on the website and keep those quote unquote outsiders in mind. So once the website is designed, or let's just say you're, you know, you're refreshing it, like how often should we rebuild it and refresh the website? That is a really good question. So this kind of depends on a few things. I wouldn't say there's any super hard and fast rule like, all right, it's been three years, like the timer's up. <laughs> but I would say around the two to three year mark, you might want to freshen up a few things. Maybe just have someone go in and like have some new pictures uploaded, make sure everything's, you know, making sense and you're keeping things up to date, obviously, like if you have schedule changes, you have new classes, new instructors, staff changes, like that needs to be up to date, like every single month. But, you know, you could have a little refresh, just some tweaks, maybe every two years or so. But usually I find around the five to six year mark, you might need to just overhaul it. Now that's, again, not a guarantee, but Usually every five to six years, like maybe the mission has changes, the messaging has changed, like sometimes your branding has even changed or you're about, you want to change it because it no longer reflects you. Uh, maybe you started as this type of gym and now you're this type of gym. So 
five to six years is when I would start thinking about it. But again, that's not an absolute. And, and, it, and I will say, especially if you are someone who, if you're a gym, who's like, oh, we put up all, like lots of new pages because we have lots of classes and workshops and special events and what, and it can get really cluttered. And you're kind of like, you've just piecemealed a lot of things together. If you're that type of, <laughs> of operation, which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that. That really, really needs an overhaul about every five to six years. Cause now you've got way too many different pages going on. Buttons have, are changing and like, okay, we need to circle back, <laughs> simplify, make sure we're making it clear what we're about, sending people in the right direction. And I think that makes complete sense, you know, just to every couple of years, refresh it. And then, like you said, five to like seven years with the yeah. build, because I must say what a website looked like five, six, seven years ago is complete, not, I don't want to say completely different, but, but it is different. <laughs> it is different. It is different. I mean, obviously just new technology and mm-hmm. like color schemes change, you know, like you know, what was modern seven years ago is definitely different than right. modern today. So yes, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about the term above and below the fold. What does that mean? Yeah. So above the fold means what appears on the website when someone first pulls up your, your website and they don't scroll like that first screenshot basically of what they see, that is quote unquote above the fold. So this is the first impression. And you actually have about five seconds to sell someone in that first impression. And I don't mean sell in terms of like, they're going to literally sign up and pay right now, but they will decide within about five seconds if they're in the right place or not. Does this feel welcoming? Is this, oh, I'm looking for a CrossFit gym. This is a bar studio. (laughs) Like I'm looking for a women's only gym. Nope. This looks like it's for everyone. So really thinking about your headline that's at the top of your homepage and the photo that's right there and making sure that truly represents and clearly articulates what type of gym that you are. And this does kind of play into mobile as well. Like we get a lot of mobile viewers nowadays. This kind of still applies Obviously, mobile screens, it's harder to see (laughs) quite as much compared to desktop, but they still can usually read that first headline, maybe see part of the picture. So whatever that looks like on mobile, again, just making sure they can at least see some of that text. Like sometimes I've gone to mobile websites and it's clearly not been optimized because the headline is like cut off. And it's like super huge text or it's super tiny or whatever. And it's like, I can see like two letters of this headline (laughs) or like the picture's way zoomed in. And you're like, what, what am I looking at? Like, this is overwhelming. So that kind of applies on mobile as well, but more so on desktop. Now off the cuff, are there any type of stats on numbers as far as people looking at websites on mobile devices versus desktop? slash laptops it's at least 50 percent, at least and that it changes based on like what type of industry you're in and I mean obviously we're talking about fitness but the stats vary based on industry and like location time of year like all that kind of stuff but I mean it's at least 50 percent. I think it might be pushing up closer to 70 75 percent we obviously spend a lot of time on our phones. <laughs> so that paying attention to mobile design and like what your site looks like on mobile is needs to be at the forefront of your mind because people will get frustrated and leave. And I was going to ask you a very similar question in the sense of, for those of, uh, of our followers out there that are listening that are maybe just opening a business or maybe thinking 2022 is going to be their year to open a franchise. The mobile device, do you need to pay extra for that when you have a website designed? How do you express to your web designer that, hey, I need to make sure that my mobile website is just as important as the desktop? Yeah. So you do not have to pay extra like or at least in the the platforms I use, like WordPress and Squarespace, you do not have to pay extra. 
I, I don't actually know of any platforms that would make you charge extra for that. <laughs> and like, especially in WordPress, uh, I can really, really customize what the site looks like on mobile. Like I, there's a lot more functionality in that Squarespace still has a little bit of like, you can really like just change like the text size on mobile versus desktop. Now working with a designer, when you're inquiring about working with them, ask them, Hey, like, do you work on mobile design? Is that part of like the editing and feedback process or not? Hopefully that is. One thing I would do is go look at like the portfolio sites that they have listed on their website and pull those up on mobile and take a look and see like, okay, is this, is it look like they've taken care of this or is it completely like illegible and text is off the screen and, (laughs) and that kind of thing. Yeah, it does. It is completely frustrating when you go on the, your mobile phone and you can just tell that the page has not been optimized for a cell phone. Yeah, it is. It is unacceptable in 2022. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for saying that. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So my next question for you is from your research, what are the top pages that people look at on industry websites? Yeah. So there's two that I would focus on, but then I also have something I'll say uh, after I talk about those two pages. The first one is your homepage. This is like the number one page usually that people are going to go to because it pulls up in Google search. If you're on Google maps, then that's usually the page that is linked. So this is the most important page. Again, you have about five seconds to convince people that they are in the right place. They should click and learn more. They should keep scrolling, that kind of stuff. So that's what you really want to pay attention to. And then your, you know, services, classes, whatever, what, again, depending on type of gym you are, that's going to be super important because people are like, Again, what type of gym is this? What type of classes or services do they have? What's the cost? Like, so we really want to make sure that these pages or page, it's just one, is super clear about location, services offered, timing of classes, pricing for the membership, for the classes, like whatever that is. So those two pages are the two I would pay attention to the most. But the thing I will say is you really need to be paying attention to your website analytics because just because the quote unquote industry standard might be these pages you should pay attention to the most, you want to be sure and like if there are a ton of people going to your about page or you know like whatever other page on your website and they're not taking whatever action it is on that particular page, that's an issue. (laughs) And so you really want to be looking at what pages get the most traffic and are they doing what you want them to do? Now, then we get into conversion rates about, okay, are they taking the action? Keep in mind, average conversion rates is two to 5%. <laughs> so not a very high conversion rate. So if don't be expecting like, okay, I got a hundred people to my website this week. Uh, like, don't be expecting 50 people to fill out your form, to call you, to email you, like whatever action it is, it's going to be very, very low, <laughs> um, which is why we need to drive more traffic. But again, that's where you want to kind of pay attention to. These are my top pages. This is how many calls, emails, clicks, whatever that we've gotten. Is that in that two to 5% range? If not, okay, so we need to do something to tweak these pages. Good advice. I want to ask you your expert advice on two pages that I like to click on. One yeah. is if there is a like an about page, mm-hmm. I love to click on that. And the second one is like meet the staff. Yes. Maybe it's just me, but yes, I want to know about the business. I do want to know about the services. It's connection for me. Mm -hmm. I love to read the story of how the, you know, the business got started or maybe the owner. And then I also like to kind of just look at the faces of the staff. How important, as I know it's just me, but overall, how important are those pages? 
No, it is important. And it really, that also plays into what type of gym you are. Like if it's just a bigger gym, you don't like have a lot of personal trainers, then the staff may not be as important. Like yes, people still might want to like see who works there, but that isn't as a high interaction gym. Whereas if you are like a small, like only personal training, like one-to-one clients and that's it, then yeah, we really want to have a good staff page. And I think this is important to really highlight like personalities, like what is the culture of this gym? Because that's what's going to help set you apart. So like, are you a gym that always plays like 90s music? (laughs) And like, it's really fun. Like that needs to shine through your website and your messaging, but also on that staff page, like It doesn't have to be headshots of everyone just like leaning up against a white wall, (laughs) you know, like if you are a laid back gym, then like show that off. It doesn't have to be this like super, you know, serious, important gym because people can get a sense of like, oh, this place seems really fun. So don't be afraid to show off that personality. But yeah, the people want to know like, where did this gym come from? Like, what's the story behind the owners? That kind of stuff. Like all of that, like you said, is going to help connect and set them apart. I love the fact that you talked about kind of taking the formality, the formal picture and mm-hmm. throwing it out the door. I just had a guest that I interviewed and he his he really talked about being different and being unique. And he Mm -hmm. he kind of touched, not necessarily right on this exact thing, but he just talked about do what everybody else is not doing. And I have to admit, usually you go on and if you see meet the staff, everybody's kind of a standard pose Mm -hmm. and then they write, you know, maybe credentials underneath and a little bit about the person. So love the fact that you're saying, hey, take it a step further, be a little more creative and show off the vibe or the energy or that person's personality. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it could be if you're like, well, maybe we're not that quote unquote fun or laid back. Maybe it's that like, yeah, you just, you're taking pictures of everyone like in the weight room or like whatever, but like have a little bio and like three fun facts about each person. Like if, if the pictures aren't fun, like add a fun fact or, or something like that. So again, like it feels a little more connection and it's not just Rob is our personal trainer and he's been here for 10 years. That's, <laughs> like, that's not, that's not fun. Like that doesn't tell me anything about working with Rob. <laughs> that's great advice. Really great advice. I like that a lot, Jessica. Now, when people visit the website, we obviously, or the goal is to, to get them to do something. So how do we make that call of action, you know, easy and compelling? Yeah. So if you can make it super clear, like really focus on one main call to action across most of your site. It doesn't have to be the only call to action, but I would really focus on like, are you wanting people to call, fill out a form, schedule a free trial, like whatever it is, make that like the most prominent, remind people it's in the footer, it's in the main navigation, it's on every page, that kind of thing. Like really hone in on that. Make sure those buttons really stand out. So like if you're really like if your brand colors are like blue, green, and yellow, and you mostly use blue and green, make your buttons yellow so that they stand out. And leave the like, oh, learn more, call now, like whatever. Try and use something that maybe sounds a little more, whatever your culture is, like if it's fun, if it's just, you know, a little more casual, like anything like that, but make it super, super clear. I like that. Have a little fun with your wording. Does it need to be yes. standard wording? So we're getting rid of the standard pictures and we're getting mm-hmm. rid of the standard wording. Exactly. <laughs> your, your, web, your website can have personality. I am pulling all sorts of good nuggets out of your information today. <laughs> All right, now I'm looking to you to give us maybe three, somewhere around three tips or tricks to convert visitors to members or at least get somebody to inquire. Yeah, so going back to what we talked about on the homepage and making sure we're converting people, having a super clear headline that talks about what type of gym you are and that kind of, you know, like we help women you know, tone up and lose weight or like whatever, not just 
get healthy, get fit. Like that's, that's not intriguing. So keeping them engaged on the website, like that's the first big step to getting more, (laughs) to getting more conversions. Um, I know we already talked about this earlier, but that headline is so, so important and really being clear in that messaging around your site. The next thing I would say is having client or customer reviews. That is so important. Like nine out of 10, I think is the stat, or maybe it's eight out of 10 people take peer reviews super, super serious. Like they are more likely to buy or sign up if they see other people having good results, like giving good praise to the business. So you really want to highlight your clients, not just the before and after pictures and that kind of stuff. I know that's, you know, super common in the fitness industry, but written testimonials, written reviews, or videos even um, is super, super important to getting more conversions because people want to see like, okay, so this is a safe place to go. (laughs) It is a good atmosphere. It's a good team, et cetera. And then last thing I would say is videos adding videos to your website. This can boost conversions by up to 85%. And I'm not just talking like, oh, we're going to do videos and like video, you know, some stock footage of people working out. No, I'm talking about like you, the owner and some of your trainers like on video and not just like, again, we're not standing against a white wall and like, hello, you should come work out at True Fitness we're open Monday through Friday. No, no. (laughs) We want this to be like personal, friendly, fun, that kind of stuff. So talking about like, hey, we love helping women do X, Y, Z. We have a lot of fun in our, in our group classes, like make it a more engaging video. It does not have to be fancy. You don't have to like hire a production crew or anything, but don't just like reiterate your location and hours. <laughs> we want us to be talking about like the culture of your gym and, you know, what the results that you help people with. Well, Jessica, you have so many, like, again, great pieces of information. I'm so excited that we were able to get you on an episode here at the Fitness Business Podcast. So thank you so much for coming on today and just talking about, you know, websites and tips and tricks and just really designing it and making it towards your own personal culture. I love that. Yes. Yes. I'm excited that we got to chat about this. Yeah. You know, you know how you take wine and like you pair food and wine together, you and Billy Polson, which I just had on, he's the owner of Diacati Fitness. We need to pair you, your two episodes <laughs> together because he talked not necessarily, he just talked a lot. You, you both are talking about the same exact points and in, in, in reference to uniqueness, be mm-hmm. different, stand out. Don't just, you know, you're talking about with the photos and, and you know, don't just stand there with your hands crossed. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a trainer for the past 10 years. So we need to pair all of you out there listening. When you listen here to Jessica's episode, you also have to go and listen to Billy Polson's episode as well, because you two are like pairing fine food and fine wine together. I love it. I love it. (laughs) Jessica, thank you again. Welcome to the Fitness Business Podcast family. And uh, we hope to have you back maybe in 2023. You can give us the newest, latest updates on website design. I would love to do that. Thank you for joining me today. I also would like to thank Jessica Freeman for sharing her industry tips and knowledge with all of us. If you have questions for Jessica, please head to the show notes at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com for Jessica's contact information. While you're on our show notes page, make sure you hit the subscribe button so the show notes will be directly emailed to you. Now, in 30 seconds, I will introduce you to Sydney Andress and Megan Simpson from Sherpa Collaborative, who will be on next week's episode. 
Did you know that the active ingredient in most disinfecting wipes has well-documented lung, skin, and reproductive health concerns? That active ingredient is called a quaternary ammonium compound, or a quat, not necessarily something you'd want in a health and wellness facility. VaporFresh disinfecting gym wipes avoid all quats and instead use an innovative citric acid chemistry to disinfect. Even with this greener chemistry, VaporFresh is still EPA-registered to disinfect 99.9% of surfaces. VaporFresh is trusted by some of the most premier gyms and college rec centers nationwide. With 1,200 wipes per roll and four rolls per case, they offer an unbeatable value per wipe. Order today at VaporFresh.com or Amazon. Quick Fire 5. Sydney and Megan had a lot of fun with our Quick Fire 5 questions. Let's hear what they have to say. Today's Quick Fire 5, we're actually going to have two guests today. I'm really excited. We're going to change it up a little bit. So we have Sydney Andres. She's a digital marketing manager at Sherpa Collaborative. And we also have Megan Simpson. She's the chief marketing operator at Sherpa Collaborative. Ladies, welcome to the Quick Fire Five. Hey, we are pumped to be here. All right. Thanks for having us. All right, so here's how we're going to do this. I have four fun questions and then one elevator pitch. I'll call you out, and uh, I can't wait to hear both of your answers. It should be a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, just let your hair down for the next couple minutes. Sydney, I'm going to start with you. What is a life lesson you learned from the pandemic? Gosh, um, I'd have to say focusing on my mental and emotional health. Being in the fitness industry, the emphasis is always on physical health. And growing up, I was a college athlete. So working out and staying in shape was always paramount. And the pandemic kind of forced me to slow down and be quiet and really be become introspective in a way. So I was able to focus on building that resiliency. I think a lot of people learned that over the pandemic, you know, how mentally tough can you get and start building really healthy habits and trusting myself. I think that knowing that I can take care of anything that comes my way now, I feel like I've gone through stuff and come out on the other side stronger. And knowing that and reminding myself of that has been a really cool learning experience from the pandemic. If we can say that something positive can come from something so sad and so isolating, it was definitely that. All right. Great answer. Now I'm going to throw the mic over to you, Megan. Same question. What's a life lesson you learned from the pandemic? Yes. Uh, I was with O2 Fitness at the time when the pandemic began and we had to close all 26 clubs. And it was so cool to see the teamwork and the resilience of everyone that worked at O2. And we spun up a whole website and made online classes and all of the instructors were teaching out of their garages and their living rooms. And we were coaching them on how to have good lighting, like don't have the light behind you. They won't be able to see you. And all of the things that, you know, just how fast everyone worked and worked together. It was so inspiring. And and on the other side was such a strong team. And I've, the things that we were able to do in two weeks when that all happened, I mean, we moved mountains and it was a really cool experience to go through that with the team. Okay. The next question, Megan, I'm actually going to start with you on this one. If you could play any character in any movie, what character would you play? Okay. I'm going to preface this with These are just the characters in the movie itself, not the people or the relationship that goes with the movie. But I would be (laughs) Mrs. Smith in Mr. and Mrs. Smith because she's so cool. I just want to like, you know, be getting ready for work and, you know, push a button in my closet and then everything spins around and like all my artillery stuff, it's all there. And I get to wear, you know, really cool outfits and flip and shoot guns in a department store. That's what I want to do. Yeah, she's like a cross between like a female Inspector Gadget and like a female James Bond. Pretty cool. Sydney, can't wait to hear what your answer is. Go ahead. Andy from the Devil Wears Prada. I, people say that I look like Anne Hathaway, which I think is a huge compliment, but also very misguided. But (laughs) I love her. I love how she changes her outfits. I think that's wonderful. Um, I think becoming girly is never a bad thing. But I also really like the message in that movie because she goes from, you know, I think a lot of people do this. They start off their career wanting to please the boss and impress the coworkers. 
And then there's a shift where you start making your work about you. Here we go with question number three. And Sydney, I'm going to go back to you to start this one off. Please complete this statement. Sunday morning, you can find me. Doing a life reset. I am either emotionally, spiritually, or physically in my house doing some housekeeping. All right, Megan, your turn. Yes. On Sundays, I'm at church with my sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders. And so I lead a middle school girls group. And a lot of people are afraid of middle school kids, but I want to be a camp counselor for the rest of my life. So it is everything. They give me a lot of energy. And then of course, grocery shopping because and adulting and doing laundry. (laughs) Well, that certainly is a good mix. You get to be a little bit of a kid with the middle schoolers and then you have to switch to adulting. Yep. All right. Speaking of adulting, Megan, can you give us a book recommendation for all of our FVP family out there? Yes. The book Switch and the subtext is How to Change Things When Change is Hard. And that is by Chip Heath and Dan Heath. And it was one of the most eye-opening books I have ever read. And if you have not read it yet, I swear I am not being paid by them. It is one of the best books I've ever read. Yeah, we've had that one before. It is fantastic. I've not read it yet, but I know everybody says that it's fantastic. So I have to get that one on my list. Oh, good. All right, Sydney, what you got? I actually listened to this on Audible. It's called The Gift by Edith Eager. And she was a Holocaust survivor turned psychiatrist, psychologist. And it's on Oprah's top books. It's life-changing. You have to listen to it. It's such a perspective shift. And it also helps you with your career, your family, all the things. All right. Two great book recommendations. Thank you so much, girls. Now we have our last and final question. And Megan, I'm going to actually just have you answer this one. It is actually, it's not an answer. You are actually going to give us your elevator pitch and tell all of our listeners out there why they need to come back next week to listen to your and Sydney's episode. All right. So next week we are going to be talking about the tips and tricks of how to get leads through Google. So 81% of consumers go online before they decide to go shopping in a store or join a fitness facility or a gym, 81%. And that means that 81% of people are going to go to Google and search for gyms near them or see what the knowledge panel says or look at your reviews or go to your website. And so all of those things are extremely important. And we will be talking about the tips and tricks that we have for you of how to make sure you're getting leads for and through Google. I wouldn't want you to miss next week's episode or any of the upcoming episodes for that matter. So subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player or better yet, let us do the work for you and we'll send you the show. Subscribe at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Thank you to our founding partner, Active Management, our partners, Keep Me My Zone, Discover Strength, Tribe Team Training, One Fit Stop, and ISSA, as well as our advertisers, Rex Roundtables, MX Metrics, and Vapor Fresh. We believe what you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but woven into the lives of others. (laughs) 